Thank you, Moeb. Buon pomeriggio a tutti. Uh, good afternoon, everyone here in the room, and also to all of those who are following the online streaming. I hope you recovered after this uh, quick break. I know this is the last talk, so hopefully I can keep you energized and looking forward. There is a nice break and a great gala dinner uh, coming up, so we have something to look forward. Uh, as you can see from the title of uh, my presentation, I'm going to uh, go back to what we heard early this morning from Professor Trout about the role of new technology in end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing. And I'm going to show you a case study, a real implementation of this into a pilot plant, hopefully to convince you that this is real, it's operational, and our next step is to take this into CGMP manufacturing operation. I would like to start by talking briefly about the definition of continuous manufacturing, um, which are mostly driven by uh, how companies uh, match risk reward uh, with, um, with risk tolerance with reward. And I group this in three main categories. A continuous process can be a single unit operation, obviously they run continuously, which is described by Pond Hay here, but we still need to move obviously the material across the various unit operation and, and uh, testing it and make sure they make specific specification before we take this to the, to the next step. Then we have point B, which is basically integration of multiple steps in the synthesis of an active pharmaceutical ingredient or in the uh, formulation of a drug product of a final dosage form. And finally, up here, we have point C, which is the main focus of my presentation, which we call end-to-end -end integrated continuous manufacturing, where we integrate multiple steps in the synthesis of the API, making the API and then directly the final dosage form onto the same manufacturing line that run under fully automated control. And this is our pictorial representation of what we mean with that. So we basically introduce raw chemical from one end and collecting product at the other end. We have reaction that run in flow, including the crystallization, so separation, and drying, and they make the API, and the final dosage form. We are not isolating any more intermediate in the API. There is no need to go to the QC lab, see if the API meets specification, and then decide whether you can go ahead or not. But we have, basically, we have a concept of uh, inline QC, if you like, which is a combination of direct measurement to process analytical technology, for those of you who are not familiar with this, these are sensors. They are connecting the, through your process and gives you real-time information on critical quality attribute. And you can use a model to then translate this data into meaningful information. And we also use here a system approach and integrated control strategy, which uh, has been discussed already this morning, when we try to optimize the system as a whole, not as a single unit operation, and even the control is applied on a plant-wide uh, approach. It's very important that this end-to-end -end process is modular. We heard from Janssen before about the importance of modularity. This is key. If you imagine an end-to-end -end line as a rigid process that can only use a specific unit operation, this might work for a couple of products, but not for all products on your pipeline. So having modular unit operation, which are able to interchange one to another, and that's where the role of new technology can play an important role, it's key such you can reconfigure your line very easily and going from drug A to drug B in a very short time and make this applicable to many different API with different physiochemical uh, properties. So this was the theory behind this. Now I want to show you our facility. This is our facility in uh, Woburn, Massachusetts, where we have our end-to-end uh, -end integrated line for small molecule drug. So the process starts on the top left corner. There are two back dump stations. We basically feed the raw chemical into this uh, uh, container, if you like. And then there is a, a vacuum conveyor that transports the powder into the first step, into that uh, uh, dissolution um, unit where we prepare the pre-reaction mixture. Then this goes into a, a continuous reaction, continuous crystallization module. Then we do continuous filtration, continuous drying. Then this heat the uh, so-called EMC, which stands for Extrusion Molding Coating. This is one of the platform technology that we are developing together with, uh, with EMA. And then we also have a solvent recovery station. We're basically taking the solvent from the uh, filtration system, the vapor from the dryer, we basically separate the solvent, we clean them, and we use it back in a closed loop so we can also be environmentally friendly and improving efficiency. 
Now, taking a look a little bit in more detail into the process uh, from within the various unit operation, again, we start with feeding the raw material. We have this, uh, this solution vessel. Then the material moves into a continuous clarification to remove solid impurity. Then we have a plug flow reactor, R1, which is integrated with the five-stage CSTR. The first four stages is where the reaction occurs. And then the final stage, in this case, is, uh, um, is where we perform the, the final crystallization. Uh, post this, we have a continuous filtration system. And then the material gets resuspended and then goes into a high shear uh, mixer vessel where we reduce or manipulate the particle size to the level that we want before entering a continuous uh, drying system and then into the extrusion molding coating machine. We also have PAT located in a critical point uh, across the process. And the first one from the left to the right is C1 in our suspension vessel. Here we use a REACT IR. And we use the REACT IR to gain very meaningful information on how the reaction progress. And also use this to see how the filtration is performed to measure the impurity post-filtration. In the high-share mixer vessel, we have an FBRM, which gives us information for the cord length distribution of the API, which then we translate into particle size. And in the dryer, post-dryer, we have an NIR, a Raman and a particle size analyzer, to basically confirm the crystal form, so we can make sure that this is what we, need, what we are making. Uh, then we have an NIR for residual solvent, and then a particle size for the particle size distribution. This is a laser diffraction. Into the MC, we also use again NIR and Raman for uh, uh, content uniformity in this case, and also for making sure that the, the drug is still in the form that uh, we, uh, we design it during the, during the API process. Now we are also developing a model for traceability, so we can track our raw material, the API that we make, and the impurity across the process. And this gives you very meaningful information for your control strategy and to make sure that you can also handle disturbances real time as they arise during the process. Now, for this to be effective, you need to understand your residence time across the process. So we study the residence time across the entire line. And as you can see here, the, the time from beginning to the end, it's about 30 hours. Let me stop just for a second. We're talking about 30 hours. We're currently about to start a project with one of the, say, top five pharmaceutical companies in which they've communicated to us that the lead time for their, for their API is two years. So imagine to go from two years to 30 hours. This is a complete change on how we manufacture and deliver pharmaceutical to patients. That's one of the enormous value of this. Uh, we have several so, uh, um, CSTR into our system, so there is also distribution. It's not just linear the residence time, so we have to run residence time distribution that, and around the entire system. As far as control, we use the uh, Delta V platform from, uh, from Emerson. So we have a, a direct interface to the process and also disconnect with the PAT such that we can provide real-time feedback to the process. Uh, we have a model the, of the various unit operation and the processes, so we can uh, basically uh, translate, as I said before, the PAT data in meaningful, meaningful data and use Syncade then for the manufacturing ex execution system. This is how the uh, pilot plan looks like. It's a very compact system, so it's about 30 meters square. It can go from 0.8 to 3 kilo an hour, and roughly to 300 tablets to uh, an hour to 4,800 tablets an hour. Now I'm going to show you a video how the process works, so you have a better idea of how the system uh, functions. <laughs>
So I hope this gives you an idea how the system is integrated and that's so the novel unit operation that has been implemented in there. Now, in the next part of my presentation, I'm going to walk you through one by one this unit operation, describing them, and show you some data related to uh, the implementation of uh, actually a key uh, generic drug that uh, we have been working on. Uh, I'll start with the, with the first step here, which is the feeding and dissolution of the raw material. So we have two raw chemical uh, powder here and one solvent, which are fed together into the uh, first dissolution vessel to prepare the pre-reaction mixture. Here, I want to show you one of the first critical material attributes. This is extremely important, this to be controlled, otherwise the reaction performance is going to be altered. And what we are seeing here is the reactant B to A mass ratio versus time. And you can see that the instantaneous uh, measurement corresponds very well with the set point. That's because we have developed a ratio controller between reactant B, reactant A, and the solvent that we introduce that allow the process to maintain uh, this under, under control over the 70 hour of continuous operation that we have run this uh, specific uh, engineering run process. Following the, uh, the preparation of the pre-reaction mixture, we have this continuous clarification bypass. As you know, when we buy raw material, we have a different degree of impurity, solid impurity that can come from different batches. And this can upset your process if you are not under control. So we have done here, we have built a continuous process to remove this uh, solid impurity and make sure that the process is not affected when you feed in a different raw material grade. What is this? It's basically a combination of filtration system that run in parallel, but each single filter run at any given time. So the, the pre-reaction material grows across the filter, so the solid impurity accumulated on the filter, there's so you have an increase in the pressure, and where we set a specific uh, pr pressure cutoff when we shift the flow from one filter to the next filter, so we don't interrupt the process, and the clean in place, the, fr the, the filter that's been compromised with the same process solvent. Here I show you some data. What you can see here is on the y-axis there is a differential pressure and the time on the x. You can see that the slowly the pressure in filter A increase because of the solid impurity accumulating here. And then when you reach the 300 uh, um, uh, the kilopascal cutoff, it shifts to the second filter. But the process actually runs continuously. It's not interrupted as is shown by the mass flow rate, by the blue line, which is basically constant. So we are giving continuous input to our re reaction without trading the process. Is this effective? To show how this is effective, we use turbidity measurement. So here you can see turbidity in NTU versus time. You can see that the black dot is the material prior to the clarification. So we have a different solid impurity in there of different degree. However, as it goes through our continuous clarification bypass, it goes back to zero over the old 70 hour to operation. The first step into the reaction is our, um, is our plug flow reactor. Then it goes, as I mentioned before, in a uh, four-stage four reaction. Here we're making, uh, it's the same reaction for making this product. And then in C1, we're basically uh, reducing the temperature to increase the, to increase the reaction yield. This is some of the data. In the plot on the ref, you see reaction versus time. Uh, you are seeing here the different stages as the reaction yield increase from stage one to stage four. And you also see that there is no much change between four and five because the reaction has been complete. What we do, we cool down the temperature to inc increase the crystallization yield, which is also pretty high. It's around 97% in the, in the final stage. I'd also like to show you the impact of whether using or not using the plug flow before the CSTR. You can see here from the red line that when we use our plug flow, we have almost 40% of conversion right away in the first 40 minutes. So that's obviously decreasing the impurity and give you a net increase in yield of 2% at the end of the process when using the plug flow integrated with the, with the CSTR. Now we're moving into inline real-time measurement of the, uh, of the system. So the first PAT implementation is in C1 in our crystallizer. So this plot here shows a key impurity, and I'll talk more about this impurity A versus, the, versus time. And you can see that the first 30 hours of operation, this in, the concentration of this impurity is constant. But then, you know, after uh, 30 hours, this increase due to lower feeding of one of the reactant B that we had, uh, we, uh, we had into the process, which is not ideal, but what I'm showing you here is actually how we the React IR, we can precisely measure this change, and this measurement actually match pretty well by the, with, the, with the HPLC data. So that's to say that we can have real-time information on our reaction, and we can use this information to actually do feed-forward control on the filter to increase the wash ratio to, improve the, um, uh, to remove the impurity. In order to do this, we have to run a DOE on the filtration, which I'll show you later on how we identify what kind of, 
how much wash do you need to use for specific condition. So this is our continuous filtration system. It's a basically a rotating disk. These are porous disks, can be in stainless steel, last alloy, different pore sites, depending on your particle size distribution. And then this machine operates on a thin film uh, filtration principle and the effective removal of the impurity in like a couple of minutes or even less. And then the material is transported into a resuspension vessel and into a high shear mixer where again we can manipulate the, the, the final particle sites. Uh, looking in more detail at the principle of operation, we deliver the slurry on the surface of this disk, then we have a nice distribution on the, on the, on the disk, and then we use basically vacuum filtration to remove the, uh, the mother ligo with the impurity, and then uh, we use different type of solvent, in this case it's two solvent to remove the impurity, and then we use a scraper and an auger to remove the wet cake from the surfaces, extruding through the center and send the material to the, uh, to the resuspension vessel. We also have a, a Clean, an active cleaning in place on the surface of the filter. So a specific area of this circle is basically continuously washed with solvent or with water, so you don't clog your filter, you can run this continuously without uh, uh, stopping this. We can also can shift from one plate to the next if necessary, if, when you have a, a problem or control um, solution to, to address. So let's look at some data now, this filtration system. Here you see the impurity concentration versus time. The first thing I want you to focus the attention is the red and the blue, blood, the two, the red and the blue uh, data point. Those are the two key impurities. You can see the, all the other are always below those, those impurities. These are the most difficult to remove. And mostly the red one, which is the reactant A, is the impurity A, which because has the lowest specification limit. So by being able to track the real time of this impurity, we can have real time information on the final purity of the product. And also this diagram, this plot, show you the importance of the integration and how some process parameter can affect across unit operation. For instance, when we run the crystallization at low temperature, you can see that the material cannot be really purified. However, when we increase the temperature, all these impurities are basically removed because they become more soluble, and so we can filter through our continuous filtration system. So this shows how important it is to understand the impact between how un one unit operation affects the nest into, into an integrated system. Now, what we wanted to do, we want to understand how much impurity we can remove with this filter. So we run basically a full DOE by taking the material from the various stages and send them directly to the filter, from stage one, from stage two, from stage three, from stage four. And what this plot shows you is that we can only purify the material that comes from stage four and five, which is basically roughly up to five and a half percent of, the, of this specific impurity. And so by this information, tracking real-time impurity A, we know how much wash solvent to use to bring the material into specification through a feed-forward control action. Post-filtration we want to verify that our material is good. So we are using again react IR here in the resuspension vessel. We look again at the impurity A because we know that that's the key impurity versus time. Again, we are talking about all the 70, continuous hour, 78 hours of operation. And again, we are matching here the react IR data with HPLC. You see in the first 63 hours, the material is within specification and the grip between the react IR and the HPLC. However, at 63 minutes here, what I'm showing you here is a case when we actually uh, there was a major clog on our filtration system, and so the impurity uh, went up, and so the control action then allowed to make the change to the, to the other filter, and then the control action now bring back the material within, again, within the specification. And you can see that there is a, a pretty good match between the uh, react IR and the HPLC data, although the downtrend, you know, it's not matching uh, precisely, but the, the, the trend is the same, and so we can still improve the model. Uh, in the uh, resuspension vessel, in the post-filtration uh, system, we also use this FBRM. So we use the FBRM for the cord length distribution of the API. So here you can see that across the engineering run, we can get pretty stable data. And when we stop the ice share mixer, you can see the count decrease and the mean square increase. So this gives us reliable information on the cord length distribution of the API, which we feed into a model to give us the uh, prediction on the particle sites when you do like your uh, offline sieve mesh. Post-filtration, we dry our material. Again, this is now a uh, series of more new technologies, a continuous drum dryer under vacuum. Uh, here we can dry the API at very low temperature without degrading them. And we're talking about the residence time or like uh, uh, even less than a minute, not like hours and hours to, um, to basically meet uh, residual summer limits of 100 of ppm. 
Post-dryer, as I alluded before, we do additional PAT measurement, NIR, uh, PSD, and Raman for particle size, residual solvent, and the crystal form. I'm going to show you now the data on this. But let's take a quick look first at the principle of operation. Again, these two drums are rotating. We deposit the slurry between the drum. Uh, we, the drum are heated, so it's a conduction heating, and then we have a different temperature probe to measure the temperature. And then when the thin layer is formed, there are blades on the side that transform the thin layer into dry particle, then then flow through a cyclonic separation out of the, of the unit operation. This dryer is also a very important feature. We can actually control the load applied on the crystal. So while we dry the API, we can also actively manipulate the particle sites of the, of the, of the API. So let me start with the Raman now. So obviously the Raman give us the, 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 the fingerprint of this drug. So by doing this inline measurement, what we can do, we can first of all identify that this is the compound that we want. But second, by identifying the key pickle crystal, uh, crystal height and uh, uh, monitoring this across the process, we know we can define that range that tells us that actually we are not losing crystallinity uh, across, the, across the, um, the integrated run. As far as the, uh, the, um, the NIR, uh, we use this for uh, uh, matching data with the, with the GC. But here I'm showing you a run to show that the, the, the I effectively remove basically the residual solvent well below the specification limits. But I also want to show you other run in which, again, this was the, the problem before when we clogged the filter, when we had a lot now of solvent uh, uh, one going to the resuspension vessel, and we reached a, a point in which the dryer could not remove anymore this residual solvent. And here I'm showing you the prediction of the uh, NIR versus the GC data. And here we still need to do some more work. The prediction follow the trend, but still not there where we would like. So we are doing additional work on the model for uh, improving those, um, those predictions. Similar for solvent two. We can predict that with this specification, but the trend needs to, needs to, be, need to be improved. As far as uh, particle size distribution, instead the match are pretty reliable. Here we are comparing an inline Marvin laser diffraction with an offline uh, uh, laser diffraction technique. And we can basically fully rely on the inline measurement. Um, and then here I'm going to show you how we actively change these particle sites with our dryer. So we have here a number of particle, percent of particle before 250 uh, as a function of the drum load. So as you can see that in the first 300 Newton, we actually reduce the particle size as we increase the force, because the drum basically uh, breaks down this crystal. But then if the load is increased, we are basically undergoing a compaction stage. So by controlling this load, we can get different type of uh, distribution that, uh, that we're looking at. Now, the API so has been fully characterized and ready for uh, uh, entering our the drug product unit operation which we call three-in-one drug manufacturing process, as it combines extrusion technology, injection molding technology, and injection coding in one single machine. The flow of the API comes from a vacuum conveyor and then enter a specific gravimetric feeder. And then the excipient mixture it's connected with the, uh, with, the, uh, with the extrusion section as well, and to a specific ratio, they are fed into the, uh, into the extrusion part of this EMC machine. And then the material is directly tra transferred into this injection molding system when we produce the, the tablets. These are the many tablets you've been able to, to produce with different uh, uh, drug load, with different sites and shape. We are able to emboss the tablets to add like a, a partition line as needed. Uh, all the tablets uh, met the pharmaceutical specification, as you can see here, in terms of retain their crystallinity. This was conformed by X-ray power diffraction as well as uh, uh, DSC, and also the purity specification and DSA were as defined by uh, the uh, USP pharmacopoeia uh, spec for this specific compound. The dissolution as well was meeting specification with a very rapid dissolution of uh, uh, almost uh, more than 80% after 50 minutes, so, so well, um, much faster than, uh, than uh, the specified. And so the, the friability test was, uh, uh, was uh, um, in pharmaceutical specification. Now, we're also working on a model to actually predict this solution. This is one of the interesting things that we're working on right now. These injection molding tablets are not, uh, their mechanism of this solution is not by disintegration, but it's by erosion. So if you can start the quick video there so they can see how the tablets erode. Yeah. Thank you. 
So you can see the seats there, but it actually don't, don't break side, it just erode from the surfaces. So that's the model that we are developing, and uh, this is driven by the API particle size distribution. So we can measure this, as you know now, real time. We can feed this into our erosion model, and we can predict what the dissolution of the tablets will be uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the manufacturing process. Similarly, we look at Raman here to identify that, you know, we, can st we still have the product that we want by looking at the fingerprint into the EMC, as well as making sure there is no loss of crystallinity with the same methodology I explained to you before, which we use into the drive, basically tracking the height of the key uh, crystal peak over time. Um, as far as the NIR, we're using this for uh, predic prediction of content uniformity into the final tablets. Here we have a real-time measurement using NIR with three different concentrations of the same formulation, a 45, 50, and 55 percent. And you can see how we can clearly define between these 5 percent ranges, and this can be utilized for the prediction of the content uniformity. Uh, the final step I want to uh, show you now is our solvent recovery system. So again, as I mentioned initially during my talk, we want to recover the cleanup, recover the solvent that we're using. And we, uh, we have integrated continuously three thin film evaporator combined with two distillation columns, and we have showed that we can uh, basically recover high purity of this uh, two solvent, but also very high yield between 95% uh, and 98% over this, uh, this, engineering, this engineering run. Again, these solvents are reused in a closed loop back into the, uh, into the solution vessel in uh, step number one. Uh, so I show you a snapshot of the various uh, key data across the single unit operation. Now I want to show you some integrated result across the entire system and see how they affect each other. I know these slides is busy, but I just want to put your attention on one key uh, element here, which I mentioned initially. It's this reactant B to A ratio. You can see it's very well maintained across the run. That means the, the performance of the reaction is stable. The impurity profile is not changing. This translates in post-filtration material, which is always within the specification across the engineering run. Drug product with GC data, which also are within the spec. And as a consequence, we produce tablets which require pharmaceutical specification. You can see that the, uh, the impurity spec and the assay uh, are met, as well as the dissolution profile and the, the, the weight of the final tablets. So we have basically show you integrated result from raw material to final tablets and how everything is connected and how everything is going to uh, affect it. I'm not going to show you today, but I have other examples, not much time. We have other example where the reactant B to reactant A ratio change and we're basically creating a significant amount of impurity. We are not able to remove this anymore, and so all the traces are basically uh, going uh, um, off the specification. So what that means in terms of application and commercial implementation. So here's the, the number of this case study that I showed to you. Uh, we were able to produce all the pharmaceutical spec as I walk you through today. Uh, we did some cost analysis for this specific product showing between cost saving between 30 to 35%. Major reduction in unit operation due to this new technology that we introduced, elimination of unit operation. Um, we also reduced the solvent use by 60%, major energy saving by 50 to 60%. The footprint is one tenth, basically, of the current batch. So the future is really miniaturized facility modular that can run under fully automated control. And again, the lead time of this system has been shortened from months and months to like 30 hours, end to end. Uh, I just would like to conclude now with the few recap, um, talking about a little bit the advantages of integrated continuous manufacturing. Uh, this is really a fully automated process with built-in quality. Uh, that means that we have higher quality assurance, it's a safer process, it's modular, we have different unit operations that can be integrated in various configurations to make many different drugs. Cost saving of all the case studies that we run goes between 30 to, to, to 50% and really allow on-demand manufacturing with very short lead time and uh, high throughput. Um, what we have done so far as a company, we have uh, basically uh, constructed this pilot plant as I show you, we have performed eight engineering run up to now, end to end. Uh, we have some more, wo more work to do to improve our model on PAT and uh, on uh, real-time action. And our next step is to bring this to CGMP manufacturing operation. So I would like, as a final say, to thank all my team who has done great work. Actually, I'm just delivering the result, but really the team behind this is a fantastic work at Continuous Pharmaceutical. And also I want to thank uh, uh, Ima for the continuous support since the foundation of the company up to today. And uh, all of you for your attention. I would be happy to answer uh, any question you might have. Thank you.
Okay, uh, thank you very much, Sal, for a great presentation. And uh, I think everyone was listening with uh, some attention. I'm sure we'll have several questions, and we have time for that. Questions? Yes. Thank you very much, Sal. Um, so my understanding is that the process is based on primarily on small molecules. What about continuous bioprocessing? Are you looking into biologics? Thanks for this question. So we are currently focused only on uh, small molecule uh, drug. However, for the future, we are still thinking about biologic. We do have actually a platform, which one of the technology we license from MIT, which can be used to incorporate the biologic into nanofiber and pro pro producing drug product, uh, solid dosage form, starting from like liquid going directly to uh, solid dosage. And this is something that you know, we are implementing in the background, but it's not the primary focus of the company right now. I think it's a very good question, just, you know, I think we need to think as in our industry we're moving more into biologics, how can we use the learnings uh, to translate that into new entities and so forth. Agree. Uh, other questions? Yes. Tony? Grazie, Salvatore. Um, I was just curious if there's enough modular nature to your process um, in case you should want to include or, or substitute in more conventional tablet production and or uh, capsule production, for example. Yeah. Versus, uh, Versus the, uh, extrusion. So as I alluded before, it was built initially with modularity in mind. It means that each unit operation are modularized with the utility on one part of the process and the unit operation on the other side, so we can easily disconnect and put in other unit operations. For example, if you want to remove some of our uh, uh, drug product application, uh, instead of making tablets, you want to uh, insert a capsule machine, uh, granule into tablets, or sterile injectable, you can easily do so by changing one model with the next. Again, it goes back, I was, what I was highlighting before is that this development, this initial design, has to keep this in mind if you want to make sure that the process is applicable to many different drugs. Otherwise, you know, it will not be uh, so effective. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? You are tired? Long day? Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, Sal. And... Uh,